Greetings, Compto family. I want to welcome you to a Compto webinar, What You Need to Know About the Legal Landscape for Disadvantaged Business Programs. We are so excited for this wonderful presentation by Ms. Colette Holt, attorney at law. A little bit about Colette. She represents public agencies and private firms on issues related to civil rights, public contracting, and affirmative action. She has broad experience in conducting defensible disparity studies, expert witness consulting and testimony, drafting legislation and policies, designing programs, managing initiatives, and defending affirmative action programs. She also consults private firms on compliance with diversity requirements. Ms. Holt serves as general counsel to the American Contract Compliance Association and is an author and frequent media commentator on these issues. We are so privileged to have Colette with us today to tell us everything we need to know about the legal landscape for DBE programs. Please give her your attention. And if you have questions that come up as you hear her presentation, please put it in the chat or the Q&A and we will do our best to take some of those questions at the end of her presentation. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Ms. Colette Holt. Well, thank you, uh, April, and good afternoon to some. Good morning uh, to others. It's still morning here in, in beautiful San Antonio, where it's actually not 100 degrees. Amazing. Um, so thank you all for inviting me to come and uh, talk about what is going on with DBE programs. Um, some of you may have been to the American Contract Compliance Association National Training Institute last month in Memphis. If so, uh, thank you for attending. Um, I've been general counsel to that group. It's well over 20 years now. Um, but this may be all new information to others. Uh, but I think it's important that people who work on contracting affirmative action programs really understand how quickly and how drastically the legal landscape is shifting. Um, and so, uh, you may find this a very depressing presentation. I've, I've been doing a version uh, of this talk uh, for the last three months, basically. Um, but the, the cases continue to come fast and, and furious, as they say. Um, so uh, hopefully this will be um, of some use to you. And I'm happy to take questions um, at, uh, um, at the end. All right, let's go to the next slide. Hopefully we can. Is this going to work here? Let's see. It was one there. Oh, no, sorry. It's just, just going a little slower. Okay. Um, uh, all right, here we go. Sorry. All right. So I want to start with some cases that actually predate uh, the Harvard affirmative action case uh, from this past June. I'm going to presume that everyone has at least heard a little bit about uh, the Supreme Court striking down affirmative action programs in higher education, uh, but there were precursor cases to that uh, that were the canary, canary in the coal mine, um, to use that hackneyed phrase, about where the federal courts are going in terms of race-conscious programs. And I do want to stress so far, all of the challenges have involved programs on the basis of race, not gender. So uh, we'll see how, how that plays out. But anyway, um, a couple of years ago, uh, there were challenges filed to what we came to call uh, the Black Farmer Cases, uh, which was a program from the U.S. Department of Agriculture under the American Rescue Plan to provide some loan forgiveness and technical assistance to socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers that had been harmed by the pandemic. Uh, and that phrase, of course, for those of you who work on DBE programs uh, that are through USDOT, um, are familiar with that phrase, so uh, keep that in mind. Um, one of the, what was really so disturbing about these cases was that uh, really we had a trial lawyer's dream record. We have a very long history, well-documented, of discrimination by the federal government itself against Black farmers. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the largest civil rights uh, settlement in history remains the challenge to USDOT brought by Black farmers. So we had cases, we had USDA reports, we had expert witness studies, um, pretty much everything that you would want in order to support a program. But the banks also objected to these program, to the program, which I think had um, something to do with, with how these cases came out. 
Um, so class actions uh, and cases were filed all across the country. It was a very well coordinated uh, and funded attack. Um, and again, uh, that's really a change from what we, we've seen over, let's say, the last 30 years that, that I've been involved in these cases, um, which have tended to be much more haphazard. Maybe it was a local contracting group or um, a, you know, a non-DBE who just decided to challenge a program. But that's not what we have now. What we have now is extraordinarily well-organized, coordinated actions across the country. Um, but probably the most important case was filed in Texas, uh, where a class action was granted of a group of white uh, farmers. And for anyone who follows this, you know how difficult it now is to get a civil rights class action certified, but uh, the court did certify a class of white uh, plaintiffs and granted a nationwide injunction, um, as well as injunctions were actually issued in Wisconsin and in Florida. Uh, the courts held that the program discriminates against whites, uh, that there was a lack of current evidence of uh, discrimination, um, that uh, the record that had been long established was insufficient um, to be able to provide relief now. Um, the, particularly the, the, the Texas opinion is, is, is more comprehensive and uh, the court held that race neutral alternatives were available, fails to say what those might be, um, but the relief is too broad that there may in fact be uh, ranchers and farmers who were not discriminated against who would get relief and particularly worrisome, and this has turned out to be unfortunately um, a preview of coming attractions, uh, was the possible creation of a new test that would require the government to prove that it, it intentionally discriminated against someone. And then uh, you'll have another, I don't know, 40 minutes or so to think about uh, all the problems that, that that potentially entails. So basically, the Biden administration threw in the towel. Uh, they changed the program and created two funds out of the original fund. Uh, one of them uh, provides assistance to farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners who, quote, faced discrimination before 2021. Um, however, discrimination is undefined in the statute, and there is zero guidance about what type of proof might suffice in order to establish an individual's experience of discrimination. So note here that, that where this is going now is rather than make presumptions about groups um, and, and looking at systemic discrimination, now this is devolving into individual cases of discrimination. Uh, there's also a second fund uh, that uh, provides uh, uh, relief to farmers who face uh, quote unquote financial distress as the result of the pandemic. So those were the farmer cases. Now let's talk about the restaurant cases. Uh, some of you may remember that at the beginning of the pandemic when Congress was basically shoveling money at everybody, uh, that it was large restaurant chains that had um, uh, sucked up most of the, of the money, you know, Darden Foods, McDonald's, those kinds of things. And so Congress was concerned that small restaurant owners were, were being left out. So the SBA, Small Business Administration, um, developed a program uh, that was going to provide some relief and uh, prioritized applications for all of three weeks uh, from restaurants that were owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, which included women and military veterans. That was struck down. Um, and this is a court of appeals decision, um, so uh, needs to be given more weight. Um, the court held that the racial component failed what's called strict const constitutional scrutiny. That's a whole nother talk, which I can't get into in an hour, but if people have questions about what that constitutional standard means, I'm happy to, to go over that very quickly. Um, there are two elements to strict scrutiny. Uh, the first is that the government must establish by strong evidence that it has a compelling interest in using the highly disfavored tool of race-based decision-making. And secondly, that any program must be narrowly tailored to the evidence upon which the agency relies. Uh, 49 CFR Part 26 is structured around the strict scrutiny framework. So hopefully that should be somewhat familiar to, to people. Um, anyway, the court uh, held that uh, the racial component uh, was not based on a compelling interest, uh, that there were 
uh, no targeted specific instances of identified discrimination. Think about this, this is early in the pandemic. Exactly what type of instances of identified discrimination would you be able to come up with by then? Uh, there were certainly plenty of evidence from a broader brush of discrimination against uh, minority-owned firms in the capital markets, uh, but of course there was no evidence yet of discrimination in access to pandemic aid. Um, the court also held that the discrimination must be intentional. Uh, quote, statistical disparities don't cut it. And I'm gonna come back to that because I think it has implications about what type of evidence people might wanna go uh, and collect in the future. Uh, the government must have participated in the past discrimination. So that would mean that the SBA uh, or the federal government itself had discriminated. Secondly, the court held that the, the program also failed the second element of strict scrutiny that the program be narrowly tailored. Um, but there was no consideration of serious workable race neutral alternatives, uh, that the program was overbroad and underinclusive at the same time. And I include this quote because I think people need to get a flavor of what the courts are saying. Um, that Pakistanis, but not Afghans are included, Japanese, but not Iraqis, and Hispanics, but not, not Middle Easterners. So the, the court's idea is that there may be people who are in groups that are not included, no evidence of this at all, uh, but uh, there may be people who are in, uh, who are in the groups and, and could get aid, but somehow had not suffered discrimination. Um, and then finally, uh, two other points that the program overly burdened uh, non-presumptive groups, in other words, white men who are not military veterans. And then this one is truly puzzling. Um, that the 51% ownership requirement is arbitrary. Um, you know, for those of us that have worked on DV and MWBE programs for decades, a cornerstone of certification eligibility is that the presumptively disadvantaged owner uh, must own and control the business and therefore have 51% ownership. Um, it's hard to know how you would call a business minority owned if it wasn't majority minority owned. I mean, this one I, I'm just utterly puzzled about, but you're gonna see it pop up in other cases as well. Secondly, um, in the restaurant case, the Vitolo case, the Court of Appeals held that the gender component failed what's called intermediate scrutiny, which again is a framework, uh, I'm happy to go into it if somebody wants me to, uh, but that governs, governs, at least supposedly governs gender. Um, that that is a lesser standard to be met by the agency than for race. Um, however, I would note that to the best of my knowledge, 1990 was the last time that a program was held uh, upheld for women, uh, but not racial minorities. But again, no instances of identified discrimination. There's no economic disadvantage test and the 51% ownership requirement is arbitrary. So those were cases that really uh, uh, were, again, precursors to what is in fact happening now. But let's talk about the um, Harvard case, the Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard and University of North Carolina case. Um, that was um, uh, June uh, 29th of this past year. I'm just gonna focus on the majority decision by Justice Roberts. I would certainly commend the entire uh, corpus of the opinions from the justices. There are a couple of concurring opinions, including one from Justice um, Clarence Thomas, that is, well, interesting. Um, and there are, there's a very uh, passionate dissent, but uh, for purposes of today, we're just gonna talk about Justice Roberts' majority opinion. Uh, first of all, he said that the group had standing to sue. Uh, what this means is that they had a right to bring the lawsuit in the first place. This was a, a big issue in the lower courts. <coughs> Excuse me. because the Students for Fair Admission is, is not really kind of a real group. It was created by a guy named Edward Blum um, and uh, they never did put up a single Asian student to say that he or she had been discriminated against or white student. Um, but anyway, the court said that despite all that, um, Students for Fair Admission did have standing to bring the lawsuit. Um, Justice Roberts then goes on to say that st race-based state action and by state, they mean government action, must be rare. Um, that the admissions programs must meet strict scrutiny. Well, we all agreed on that, I think. 
Um, I never use race as a stereotype but, or negative and very importantly, must end. Um, he says that there are only two times that the Supreme Court has recognized the use of race as meeting the compelling interest requirement. The first is in remediating specific identified instances of past discrimination. And the second is to avoid a prison race riot. Other than that, according to him, the court has never recognized the use of race. Um, the admissions programs were held to be insufficiently measurable to permit judicial review. This is basically a rejection of the concept of diversity. Uh, he says that training future leaders, uh, diversity of viewpoints and experiences, uh, that those are insufficiently coherent to meet strict scrutiny, that it's impossible to measure them or to know when they have been achieved, um, and that there is no meaningful connection between the means used and the goals um, specified. And again, he goes back to this uh, idea that the racial categories were overbroad, Asian rather than South Asian or East Asian, arbitrary or undefined Hispanic or under-inclusive that people from the Middle East who have always been considered to be white um, unless they are of another racial group because you know that's a location, not a race, um, uh, but that they were not included and so therefore the program was potentially under-inclusive. The Hispanic uh, comment is, is puzzling to me um, because in fact, uh, both universities had used the Census Bureau's definition of Hispanic. So it's not undefined. I'm not sure exactly where that's coming from. He goes on to say that race may never be used as a negative factor. Uh, hard to know uh, what type of preference program would not be negative as against the person or individual or group that was not given the preference. Um, he notes the college admissions are essentially a zero sum game. There's one slot, one person gets it, um, and therefore race is being used in a negative way. Hard to see how that would not be the case. Uh, he goes on to say that race may not operate as a stereotype. And I have to quote here because you really need to get a flavor of, of these opinions. Um, that the program, quote, engages in the offensive and demeaning assumption that students of a particular race, because of their race, think alike. Uh, and that that is contrary to the core purpose of the Equal Protection Clause. Now, you know, for, for civil rights lawyers, this is really a departure from anything we thought before. I don't think that the people who uh, wrote uh, the 14th Amendment were thinking about um, offensive or demeaning assumptions about how anybody thought. You have to remember, the Civil Rights Amendments were in response to slavery um, and an entire legal structure of oppression. Um, I don't know if they were thinking that that core purpose was about how somebody thought about something, but that's now the law as the Supreme Court has given it to us. Uh, government actors, um, again, quote, cannot intentionally allocate preference to those who may have little in common with one another, but the color of their skin causing continued hurt and injury. Um, this is really coming out of Justice uh, Thomas's um, dissent, I mean, excuse me, concurrence, um, and, and many opinions that he's written over the years um, that in his view, affirmative action injures um, uh, minorities, especially black people, um, and that therefore um, they are hurt by affirmative action. Um, very important, uh, Justice Roberts says the programs must end. Uh, he refers back to a, a comment in a case called Gruder versus Gratz, uh, excuse me, of Grutter versus the University of Michigan um, from 2003 in an opinion by Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, where she notes, she says, in upholding the University of Michigan's undergraduate admissions program, upon which all of these other programs were based. So note that students for fair admission overrules that case. But she says there in the, in the Grutter um, case that surely in 25 years, we won't need these programs. Well, I thought in 2003 that she was being wildly naive and optimistic to think that by 2028, uh, we wouldn't need affirmative action anymore. But she does say it, and Robert gloms onto that uh, by saying programs must have an end. Uh, racial balancing is patently unconstitutional, that the government must treat citizens as individuals, not simply components 
of a racial, religious, sexual, or national class. So again, going back to this idea that discrimination is not structural, um, but it is individual experiences and that therefore everyone must um, be treated on an individual basis. Uh, where I honestly think this, this goes is that class-wide relief, um, at least from a legislative standpoint, may not be um, constitutional anymore. Um, periodic review is not sufficient. Both schools said, well, you know, we take a look at our programs on a regular basis. Um, and Justice Roberts said, that's not good enough. You got to end it. He ends by throwing applicants a little bone and says the colleges may, however, consider how race has affected an individual applicant's life. Makes me glad I don't have a high school senior trying to figure out what you can and cannot write in an essay. Um, there is a curious footnote, footnote four, where he explicitly says that the military academies, the service academies, have, quote, potentially distinct interests and so are not bound by the opinion. So we'll get to that in a minute. So that's the fair admissions case. And of course, again, if people have questions, uh, please do uh, put them um, uh, in the chat. Um, so there are some other cases that you need to know about, uh, uh, and both of the ones I'm about to talk about were filed before students for fair admission, but the opinions, uh, the judge stayed the cases uh, waiting for the Supreme Court. Well, now we know. Um, so the first one is a challenge to the Minority Business Development um, Agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce, which has been around, I think, since the Nixon administration. Um, it had always been uh, by an, an executive order, but in the uh, recent legislation, the Infrastructure Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, MBDA was enshrined in statute, and we all hoped that would provide some protection. <coughs> oh, excuse me, ball allergies. But that so far is not to be. Um, MBDA is a business center's office for technical assistance, but it was only to minority-owned firms. So we all had to stipulate that that was, in fact, the case. Oh, and I, maybe I should have started with a little bit of disclosure. I am the Department of Justice's expert witness in this case, so I know quite a lot about it. Um, the plaintiffs are three uh, small white uh, business owners who would otherwise be eligible for services if they were, in fact, minority businesses. And the program has been temporarily enjoined. So here's what the, 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 the uh, trial court said. Again, that the program failed the compelling interest requirement. There's no evidence for all the included minority groups or all the type of businesses that could be served by MBDA. Quote, the government cannot create a patchwork of racial preferences based on statistical generalizations about any particular field of endeavor. Um, that broad statistical disparities are not sufficient. Evidence must be industry specific. Disparities must be linked to intentional discrimination by eliminating all variables that could account for the disparities. Well, now as someone who's you know, done disparity studies and written the, the model and testified about them for decades now, um, it is impossible to eliminate all possible variables for an outcome, because you can only eliminate variables about which you can get reliable data. Um, this is a variant of um, objections that were raised and rejected for years now that, well, you know, maybe it's their upbringing and were they uh, single parent households? And I mean, all these, there's a, a million possibilities. So if all variables is really what the courts mean, that is going to be a huge research problem. Finally, that the government must have participated in the past discrimination it now seeks to remedy. Um, the program is not narrowly tailored. Race-neutral alternatives have not been tried and failed. the government has failed to show that no workable race-neutral alternative would achieve the interest sought. Uh, we did put on a, uh, uh, put up a uh, Commerce Department report that, you know, again, I had a role in drafting. Um, from 2016, which was a review of disparity studies, but it is in fact correct that, that it does not detail which agencies actually implemented and measured the success or failure of race neutral recommendations. 
Um, again, the, the program is under-inclusive and scattershot because it may exclude many MBEs, again, back to this Middle Eastern idea, um, and MBEs who own less than 51% of the firm. You, you've seen a pattern here um, that the program may be over-inclusive because it helps individuals who may never have suffered discrimination. Um, but because the plaintiffs were from Wisconsin, Orlando, and Dallas-Fort Worth, only those centers are covered by this injunction. Expect to see cases filed in other places. So um, our uh, briefs uh, were due because this was a preliminary injunction only. Um, August 25th, the judge gave us basically about two weeks to pull that, that together, which frankly is a terrible sign. Uh, and um, we'll see. So, you know, check back with me in a couple months and then we'll know. So that's the case against MBDA. You probably have heard about this case, which is a case against the SBA's 8A program. Um, and uh, this one has gone a little bit further. Uh, the court uh, held that uh, the presumption of social and economic disadvantage for racial and ethnic minorities was unconstitutional and has enjoined that preference. Interestingly, in this case, the plaintiff is a white female who had lost contracts when um, uh, contracts she had already had and they were up for renewal were moved into the 8A program. And um, as many of you may know, uh, you can get 8A certified if you are a female, but you have to go through the individual door, very similar uh, to the appendix to 49 CFR part 26. Uh, the court goes on to hold that the program is not based on a compelling interest. Again, no evidence for all the groups and all the types of businesses. Uh, that broad statistical disparities are not enough. Um, you must be industry specific. One of the things that's particularly worrisome um, in this uh, case is that the plaintiff is in the, some kind of natural resources uh, consulting. It's very specific. Um, and so one way to possibly read this opinion is that you'd need statistical disparities for every single NAICS code. That is nothing we have ever done um, and uh, probably don't have enough observations for every single code, um, that the disparities must be linked uh, to intentional discrimination, again, by eliminating all the variables. The government must participate in the past discrimination it now seeks to remedy. Uh, the program's not narrowly tailored. There's no termination date. That is true. The, you know, the SBA Act doesn't have a date when it, it sunsets. Um, and there's no specific remedial objectives or goals, um, which is, of course, unlike the DBE program, which has the national 10% aspirational goal. So the SBA, in response to this, is now requiring individual narratives from applicants. If you go to sba.gov, you, you can find uh, this, this, this sort of roadmap, I guess, about all the things that an applicant is supposed to be able to discuss um, to establish that uh, he or she has in fact suffered discrimination. It looks quite complicated to me. I would, if you're uh, dealing with any businesses that, that might be interested in this, I, I hate to say this, but I would really suggest that they get um, legal assistance to do that. Not me, by the way, I'm not doing that. Um, but, but I do think that um, a lawyer taking a look at this would probably be a good idea, especially because anything that is submitted is potentially subject to a mail or wire fraud prosecution. And I would not put it past a very aggressive United States attorney somewhere to go after somebody about this, um, calling it certification fraud. So this is, again, very, very concerning. The plaintiffs are actually challenging this saying that it isn't enough to just have individual narratives that the entire structure of the 8A program is unconstitutional and therefore no new 8A contracts can be solicited. So again, keep your eyes on that one. A couple other cases um, on a different front, uh, but people are now going after really small stuff. Um, Bear County, Texas, which is San Antonio. Um, I guess I should put uh, Texas in there. Um, tried to use ARPA money uh, to provide grants uh, of up to $50,000. Um, the plaintiff is a white male who would have qualified for $50,000 grant, except for that the county adopted a scoring methodology that gave six extra points each to being a minority 
a woman or a veteran owner. Down here in what is uh, nicknamed Military City, we have the largest um, uh, group of uh, military installations in the country is in San Antonio. It would indeed be possible to hit this trifecta. Um, and by the time uh, the county had scored everybody, there was no more money left for this guy. Um, that case is pending. Again, that case was brought uh, by one of these very aggressive, active um, uh, legal uh, policy firms that are going after all these programs. And let me say that um, the Federalist Society, uh, which you may be more familiar now if you weren't already, um, as being um, uh, Leonard, uh, Leo Leonard's group that um, has been um, very um, instrumental with uh, providing benefits to Justice Thomas, um, Justice Alito. Uh, they were the pipeline for the Trump administration's 270 plus judges uh, that were appointed. Uh, they got a $1.6 billion donation. You can buy a lot of litigation with that. So again, these groups are very well organized and very well funded that they went after Bear County's program tells me they are out looking for programs to challenge. Um, last week, um, last Tuesday, as a matter of fact, West Point was sued by the same group that sued Harvard and the University of North Carolina. So taking Justice Roberts up on his footnote four a statement that maybe the service academies are different. Um, and so they are uh, suing West Point. Um, and I just had to, to, to share this sentence with you because it, it's just so astonishing to me. Um, and um, my husband's nephew uh, has gotten through Beast Week at West Point this year. Uh, and um, the idea that, that West Point is, instead of admitting future candidates based on objective metrics and leadership potential, West Point focuses on race. Um, if you know anything about how difficult it is to get into the service academies, the idea that everybody there is there on some kind of affirmative action program is, is really rather extraordinary. Um, but stay tuned on that one. And then finally, and I just didn't have time this morning to uh, add this slide, uh, but I'll share with you that the city of Houston was sued last week. Um, over its local minority and women business enterprise program. So they are now definitely going um, after um, local programs. I didn't include a case uh, that was in fact filed against the DBE program because it got dismissed, um, but without prejudice. Um, it was a challenge to the DBE program component on the infrastructure, um, IIJA, bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, but the court held that the plaintiff in that case did not have standing to bring the lawsuit because no contracts had been solicited yet. Well, obviously, that's something that's going to be remedied. Um, so I would definitely um, assume that we are going to get challenges to the DBE program itself. Um, just some information about all the private sector challenges that have already been filed. Um, this was not really what I expected, uh, that the, there'd be so much activity against private sector programs, but it's out there. Um, there's something called the American Alliance for Equal Rights uh, has sued the fearless fund management. This one started to get a little bit of national attention. There were some articles in the Washington Post about it and, and um, the Wall Street Journal. The fearless fund um, provides all of $20,000 grants to black women and a little bit of mentoring. Um, and uh, they have been sued for race discrimination by limiting the fund to just Black women, um, uh, Target, you know, big red circle Target has been sued. And this is a in very interesting and scary case because this is a shareholder suit brought under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 that says the Target's DEI initiative and its Pride Week uh, activities caused the shares of stock to uh, devalue and that therefore the CEO and the board of directors who have been sued in their individual capacities are in breach of their fiduciary responsibilities to the shareholders. Um, so we'll see what happens with that one. Um, Amazon uh, has been sued. Uh, they do, if you've noticed, uh, maybe down now, they used to flag whether it was a black owned business 
they had something called the Black Business Accelerator to help Black-owned firms be able to get onto the site and sell and some other things, some employment initiatives, and they have been sued. Um, 13 state attorneys general have threatened the Fortune 100 companies with lawsuits. Two major law firms have been sued about their minority internship programs. One of them, Morrison and Forster, folded immediately. Um, the other one, Perkins Coie, is still hanging in there. But um, another very large law firm, Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher, which wasn't even a party defendant, has already scaled theirs back to being, you know, are you disadvantaged or something? They're all taking race explicitly out of the uh, uh, consideration. There have been dozens of complaints filed by these groups um, at the EEOC, the federal EEOC, and DEI programs were already being cut back. Uh, Coca-Cola, uh, a good year and a half ago, scaled back their program through a threat of a shareholder lawsuit. All right, well now, that I have hopefully sufficiently depressed and frightened everybody, because I think people really do need to know what's going on. What might agencies do in response? Well, certainly conduct a thorough program assessment um, and be uh, very skeptical. Look at your program through the eyes of a plaintiff. Um, so for example, do you have any contract data about um, what happens when you put out contracts without any type of DBE goals on them? Uh, this has been this type of information, this unremediated uh, markets data, we call it, has been very helpful over the years in being able to defend programs. Do you have a supportable contract goal setting methodology? It's entirely possible that plaintiffs may skip the compelling interest challenge and say, sure, Congress had a sufficient basis to adopt a DBE program, but your agency's implementation of the program fails strict scrutiny. Do you have a realistic and workable good faith efforts process? Yay, everybody's got the appendix, blah, blah, blah. But um, do uh, prime bidders uh, submit good faith efforts documentation? And is it ever accepted? What's the rate? Do you have any data on that? I find when we're doing disparity studies, very few agencies can answer yes to that question. Are you doing adequate data collection? Um, do you have uh, NAICS code data for all of your firms, not just contracts with goals, not just contracts subject to the program? Um, are you using too broad industries, construction? Um, what does that mean? Uh, what about non-certified subcontractor data? Do you have any performance metrics other than meeting the goals? Uh, absolutely enhance your race neutral approaches, uh, both because you're gonna need that in litigation but also we should have been doing all of this all along. Uh, review your specifications and your timelines or your, or your uh, uh, bids, uh, invitations for bid or RFPs or whatever, only out for two or three weeks. Um, do you require um, more, more uh, experience than anybody really needs to have? You know, what about pre-qualification? Um, please do get rid of paperwork, um, redundancy. Do you need 18 signatures in order to get a contract signed? Um, and other unnecessary requirements, pay on time. I cannot stress how important this is. This is the most important thing that your agency can do is make sure that you pay people on time because all the rest of this won't matter. Um, and um, if you've ever been to Chicago, which is really my home, um, I married a Texas boy, so now I live down here, but Chicago's home. Um, if you've been to our wonderful Millennium Park where we have the bean, um, and all these wonderful things there. That project for the city of Chicago bankrupted the biggest black contractor and the biggest black engineering firm in town because the city was so slow in paying them. So I, I just can't stress this, uh, stress this enough. Um, are you doing more virtual outreach events? Are you making sure you're always doing pre-bid uh, uh, pre conferences? Um, what about additional contractor engagement? All those things are really important. Um, do focus on prime contract awards. Do you have a protocol to unbundle uh, uh, contracts? Um, everybody talks about it. Are you doing it? Um, you might want to uh, um, uh, engage in a gap analysis, uh, focusing on industries and the types of contracts where you have low utilization and seeing what you can do about that. Um, do increase 
high quality technical assistance. Um, and hopefully you can do some of it on a race neutral basis. Um, certainly the best practices involve individual assessments, one-on-one uh, -on -one counseling um, and commitments from sureties and um, finance uh, entities that they will in fact bond, uh, finance and ensure uh, firms that have participated in your program successfully. Um, you know, you can do training videos all day long, but that doesn't actually get anybody a bond. Um, and certainly consider collaborating with other agencies um, in order both to reduce the burdens on the DBEs as well as be good stewards of what resources you're going to be able uh, to get. Um, very much urging agencies to do availability analyses, uh, making sure that you can in fact measure your outcomes, you can benchmark your outcomes against availability and comply with Title VI. Um, I am and I am predicting that there were going to be a lot more Title VI complaints, a lot more action under Title VI if the rest of these programs uh, fall. It's going to be really the only avenue that minority-owned firms are going to have in order to try to ensure that, that, that there's some equity in an agency's contracting. Um, so let's talk about availability analysis real quick, and then I'm going to wrap up in a minute so we should have enough time for questions. Um, you must have complete, highly detailed, six-digit NAICS code for all of your contracts, not just the contracts with goals um, or that are subject to the program. Um, you probably will need an excellent electronic tracking system to do this. You can do it in Excel. It is very cumbersome, and it is way too slow. Um, ask yourselves, are your firms achieving parity? Look at where they're not. Think about how you're going to put resources there. Not sure how regularly to do these. Um, maybe every 24 months. I think every year is probably not realistic. Um, you start to stretch out three or four years. The data might be too old. Um, so I'm thinking every 24 months or so. I'm um, going back to Title VI, do enhance your Title VI procedures. Make sure everyone is fully trained. People cannot say, well, it's Title VI. Uh, make sure that people know how to file a complaint. Um, take a look. I love this page at the Washington State Department of Transportation's page. Right there, it says, do you want to file a complaint? And you click, and it walks you through the, or the complainant through the process. Are you maintaining data? Who's been filing them? What's been the outcome? Get your documents in order. You may get a freedom of information request and even a subpoena. And remember, it is your burden as an agency pro to, is to produce documents. It won't do in federal court to say, eh, we don't know where they are. If you can do any type of uh, small business program under your state law for your non-federal aid contracts, certainly do consider that if you're not already doing that. Um, you may be able to use set-asides uh, or points for negotiated procurements and even bid preferences. It's all driven by state law. Um, you'll have to figure out criteria for eligibility. What size? Do you want a personal net worth test? What about other factors? Some agencies are now trying to look at things like, uh, is your business located in a disadvantaged area? Are you the first person in your family to go to college? Those kinds of things. We'll see. For sure, do try to educate your DBEs because I, I'm finding that they have, many of them, no idea what's going on with all this. And if you are a firm that is highly dependent on goals contracts, I would suggest that you start thinking about what your plan B is. I'm suggesting that agencies pause any new disparity studies, which is really saying something coming from me. Um, but I am a lawyer and my ethical obligation is to give the best advice I can even when it conflicts with my own economic interests, um, probably especially when it conflicts with my own economic interests. And given the way the courts are going, I don't know that a full dress disparity study is a good use of resources. You only need them if you wanna set contract goals, you already can't give points and bid preferences. If the courts continue to reject statistical evidence, then there is no reason to do a disparity study because that's what a disparity study is. It's statistical evidence. If that's not gonna be enough, then you wasted your money. Um, what if the courts are gonna require specific instances of intentional discrimination? Disparity study is not gonna give you that 
Um, you may have people who can talk about instances where they were discriminated against, but that's not evidence of discrimination by the agency itself. And I would posit that no sane government lawyer is going to go into federal court and say, good morning, your honor, my client discriminates. And it's a trick bag anyway, because the response should be, well, stop it, not you need a program. So my own view at this point is rather than spend the hundreds of thousands of dollars and for state DOTs, these can run into the you know, million dollar plus range. I would rather that you spend the money doing outreach and making sure that you're doing everything you can to build the capacities of DBE so that they can compete in what may become truly open markets. So that is everything I have this morning and I am happy to take any questions. I have not been monitoring so much. I think April is. Yeah, I was taking a look. I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for that very comprehensive overview. <laughs> well, <laughs> very <Seriously>. depressing. <laughs> Seriously taking notes over here. Um, so I just want to share a couple of questions that came through and some questions of my own. One of them is the most famous question, are a copy of these slides, can they be made available to the folks on the call? Is that something you could share with me? No, and here's why. Okay. I'm not sharing slides with anybody because... Okay. I think this is a roadmap to how to sue you, mm, right? And once I let them go, who knows, right? right? And if you get them on your work computer at an agency, they now belong to the agency. If you got a Freedom of Information Act request, you're gonna have to turn them over. So, so I, I, I hate that minute. I can't do it, but I'm, I'm, I'm frightened about where this might lead. 100%, so as you all know, um, we did record this, so you can at least listen back to right. the topics that were discussed and be like me and furiously take notes in that way. Okay? But just be careful, people, because people are coming for these programs. I just, it, it's such a different environment than when I first started, where the lawsuits were often brought by a contractor group that went to their construction lawyers, and they made a lot of rookie mistakes in federal court. My interest my father used to say was an old trial lawyer, which was, and it's good advice anyway, do not confuse the incompetence of your opponents with your own brilliance. And in a lot of cases, we had some kind of weak opponents. That's not true now. These people have Koch brothers money. They have all kinds of money and they are coming for these programs. That's clear. And as you stated, these attacks are well-organized, coordinated, and well-funded. So much mm -hmm. different than what we've seen in the past. Yep. One of the questions that came through also was, are you aware of any cases involving Native Americans that needed to prove that they were enrolled in a state or federally recognized tribe? No, no, I haven't seen that yet. Um, but it's, I'm not sure where that would come from. I mean, these folks are, are challenging these programs at a much broader level. Now, it may be that there are some Native American firms who want to challenge that requirement. And I will be honest, I think there's some equal protection problems with this, that we are requiring one group to jump through all these hoops that other people don't have to jump through. But, you know, that's just my view. I'm not sure that's right, but I think it's at least an argument that could be made. But right now, I, I would really hope that DBEs wouldn't be suing anybody. I mean, we don't need to be getting it coming and going. Absolutely. So I do see folks with their hands raised, but if you could put okay. it in chat or the Q&A, we appreciate it. Another question, for our MWDBE firms on the call, you, you mentioned SBA requiring individual narratives and a recommendation on getting legal assistance on those. Is there anything else that you would recommend to MWDBE firms to prepare for the changes that are likely coming in their state and to stay informed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, you know, stay informed, check back with Comto. You know, um, we maybe we'll do another one of these like after Christmas or something when we I was gonna say we need to do out more cases, right? Right. I, I, I actually literally have to update this thing every single day now because yep. I was in the middle of about to go. Well, I gave a speech in Portland, Oregon last week, and I was on my way down in the elevator when this West Point case popped up. 
And I'm like, well, damn, I don't have time to fix these slides right now because I got 30 seconds till I'm on. You know, right. kind of things. There's just so much happening here. It's just really, really, really scary. So stay informed. But I think the other thing is take a hard look at where your client base is. If you are highly dependent on goals, ask yourselves, can I strengthen my relationships with those prime contractors such that I am bringing real value beyond meeting the goal? Is there work that I might be able to start doing as a prime? What do I need to do to increase my capabilities to get out here and compete against other firms? Am I, if, and if you're more on the construction side, I realize that many people will stay subs. I mean, if you do MEP work, you're gonna be a sub. That's not, you know, that's not what you do. But if you are not getting work outside of the program, if you can, if you've got the relationships with them, sit down and talk to those primes that use you on goals contracts, but don't use you on non-goals contracts. Why? Is it that you're not cost competitive? I hear that a lot from primes, that the reason we don't use DBs because we are on outside goals is because they they cost more money and it's low bid work. And I always challenge them about that, but they go, yeah, but in a, when there's a goal, we know other primes are going to need to use DBEs too. So we can kind of adjust, but if there's no goal and it's low bid, and the DBEs are always 10% higher, we're not going to use them. Another thing you can do is try to get debriefs from the agency if you did bid as a primer or, or a consultant or whatever. Um, just insist that somebody sit down with you about why you weren't successful so that you can get as much information and then take advantage of the programs that are out there. I know it's hard. I'm a small business too, right? I mean... So I know, and, and you know, I always tell anybody who wants to start their own business, um, I, you, you, you okay with not ever sleeping? Uh, is if you're not, you need to keep a job, okay? So I appreciate how hard this is to stay on top of things, but you just got to. I am really worried about what's going to happen to the DBs. I appreciate that. And we, I also want to make sure if folks are not aware about the equity and infrastructure project, and this is a yeah. project started by Phil Washington. And the entire goal of that project is to have more small businesses as primes on mm -hmm. contracts and to build generational wealth. So if you're a small business on this call, or if you're an agency on this call, I would encourage you to look up equity and infrastructure project and look at some of the organizations um, that have made a pledge to do so. And mm -hmm. if you connect with them, they'll be able to tell you the way they've assessed their current goals, the way they plan to increase their goals. Um, it's a little bit fluid. Um, they're, they're not being required to have an exact number of increase, but they are looking to increase. So if you're a small business, you're going to want to connect with those agencies because they're looking for you. And if you're an agency looking for what right looks like or some type of example to point to, then you can look to those agencies. Out of this project, there was a reciprocity agreement set up between SEPTA and CTA, one of the first of its kind. Um, so many good things are coming out of this project, but I would encourage those, if you're not aware of it, to, to look it up and connect with some of the folks who are um, a part of that. We had another question come through um, asking if it affects local state programs. Mm -hmm. Does this affect local state programs? Well, it will. <laughs> um, if, if, if the federal government isn't gonna be allowed to do anything about the continuing effects of slavery, it's hard to see how the state or the city will. And of course the city of Houston got sued last week so I am certainly anticipating uh, more, more lawsuits at the state and local level. And to be frank about it, many of those programs are weak and they rest on very weak foundations. Um, so this might be the time to be talking to your local officials about what can you do to increase those race neutral alternatives because you know, many agencies are, are just not in a position to do very well. They may have a program on paper, but doesn't mean that it's actually achieving very much. So true. Colette, I think we definitely are going to need to do a repeat of this. Um, as you stated, maybe around Christmas time or maybe at the first of the year, just so that folks get a, a fresh take on the landscape. And <laughs> There's more to say. say. Do we have more questions? I hope maybe we do. Um, Greg Bradley says, instead of using race programs should, and I just lost it, use in, um, some requirements. Yes, well, I mean, certainly if you're going to have a race neutral program, I, I would think that you would want to do that. 
Now, you know, in, in my endless quest as a, as a basically happy, optimistic person um, to try to think about what can we do that would be useful now, um, if you are going to adopt a small business program and it is not for DOT funded contracts, seems to me you're not stuck with the size requirements and the P&W from DOT. My own view has always been that they are way too low. And you could try to tailor that more for your individual community. You know, I lived in Oakland, California for eight years. And a, and a you know, P&W 1.32 million would make you barely middle class in the Bay Area. Now that might make you wealthy somewhere else, but if you're gonna do small business programs, maybe think beyond what SBA and DOT are doing if you are in, a, in, a, in an environment with very high costs. Um, so maybe, you know, cause that's one of the problems is people don't want to graduate. I hate that term. They don't want to become ineligible. It makes them like get a little hat, you know, and they walk across stage or something. Um, <laughs> because they don't want to get out of the program because they know they're not going to get work. But if we were to raise the size limits in the PNW in a small business program, we might be able to grow some more firms so that they can get to some size of something. I mean, you know, even in South Texas, which is a much less expensive place to live than Oakland, these limits are really, really low. And especially if you want to do infrastructure work. If you're so tiny as you can be a DBE, you can't do hardly anything for TxDOT. I mean, they got five, six billion dollar projects going on. So anyway, it's just something to think about. Would you give any advice to any just us as individuals, as we think about uh, Compto being an advocacy organization, what can individuals do to advocate for um, fairer treatment or for a better landscape uh, in procurement for small businesses? What would you say? I would say really start focusing on these race neutral alternatives, which is saying something coming from me, because I was the person for 30 years who, who poo pooed race neutral. And I used to have this thing I would say, which is, well, it's like saying the patient needs a triple bypass, but we're going to tell them to lay off the McDonald's and the martinis. Well, you should lay off the, you know, you should do that, but you need a triple bypass. And I see these programs as, a, as attacking the, the fundamental disease of racism and sexism. And race neutral is going to be a less successful alternative. It just is but it might be all we have. So advocate in your agency or whatnot, get these people paid on time. What about pre-qualification? I'm on a mission about this one because what I see it as is, a, is an agency imposed barrier to people doing work. And you'd be surprised for those of you that are state DOTs, the variation across the country in pre-qual, which tells me that the more restrictive ones aren't necessary. Because when you drive coast to coast, you don't notice whether it was you know, Nevada DOT or Illinois or whatever, the roads are all the same. So pre-qualification is something you might really wanna start challenging. Um, insurance requirements, um, especially on consulting contracts, do you need $5 million worth of commercial general liability for a $300,000 contract? Really, I find agencies are on autopilot. This is how we've always done it. I have a whole series of slides about does your agency need to change? So I would focus there and advocate for the change that you can get. Um, I don't know what to do about these judges. You know, was a group that wants to go pick at their houses. I, I ain't got time for that because I, I don't see that's going to help. The equity in, in um, infrastructure project is very interesting. And both SEPTA and CTA have been my clients, um, especially CTA. I've been working with them for years. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, they have a very aggressive race neutral program for their non FTA funded contracts, of which they spent a lot of money, like those, but a lot of the bus shelters, you know, plowing, I hate to say this, but plowing all the snow. Um, you know, they spend millions of dollars on maintenance, and that's not FTA funded work. So think about all of those avenues. We've got to get out of the mindset that it's DBE, DBE, DBE only, and look more broadly because I'm not sure we're gonna have DBE.
As always, phenomenal, Colette. Insightful. Thank you so much for your insight. We will have you back. You and you know, people can can email me directly. Please do not send me messages through like LinkedIn or Facebook. Please don't do that. I am old and old school, and I don't pay attention to that stuff much. So people are like, I sent you something through LinkedIn. Email me, please. You're much more likely to get a response. And I'm and I'm happy to do it again, April. Thank you for all the work that Comto has done. I haven't done anything with you guys in a very long time. So I'm happy to be back. We're going to change that, Colette. We're going to have you regular. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye.